it's time to move forward. We have um, we have many amazing presentations still ahead of us, uh, and right now, uh, please welcome Holly O'Donnell. Hey, Holly. Hi. How are you? Great. How are you? It's great I'm, seeing you. Yeah, I'm so excited to be taking part. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, Holly will uh, tell us about the life in the Amazon region. Um, there will be something about the fieldwork, the frogs, and short-eared dogs. I'm intrigued. <laughs> Holly has fieldwork experience in Antarctica, in Zimbabwe, Paraguay, Ecuador, and Peru. And, well, Holly, now the floor is yours. Please tell us about what you do. Great, thank you, Olga. Are you going to share your presentation with us? Yep, just get yep. there. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it takes about a minute. There we go. Is that looking good on your end? Yes. You want to go full screen? Oh, is it not full screen for you? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. Okay. okay. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. So, yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm really honored to be taking part, and I'm really excited to talk to you all about the Amazon rainforest today. I'm Holly O'Donnell. I'm a conservation biologist. Um, and at the moment, I work for the ASEER Foundation and for Tamandua Expeditions. Amazon Rainforest is the perfect fit for the Global Biodiversity Festival because it is one of the most biodiverse places on Earth. In fact, the region where I work in the Peruvian Amazon, Madre de Dios, has been recognised as the most biodiverse place on the planet. Today, I want to show you some of the incredible biodiversity that I encounter in my day-to-day -day life working there. I want to start by talking about trees. I have grown to love trees during my time in the Amazon. Walking past a familiar tree on a trail is almost like passing an old friend or a neighbour. And I couldn't agree more with Jane Goodall when she says, to me, trees are living beings and have their own sorts of personalities. Unbelievably, there are over 16,000 species of trees in the Amazon and over 40,000 species of plants. I thought I would highlight a couple for you today. The tree on the left here is a kapok, also known as a shiawako. They are an emergent species, meaning that they are some of the tallest trees in the rainforest and they stick out above the canopy. They are also some of the oldest trees. The tree on the right is a Brazil nut tree. You might have eaten Brazil nuts, many are exported. Um, if you look very closely, you can see me standing at the bottom of this tree to the right, it's huge. Brazil nut harvesting is a very common activity in the area where I work. A lot of land is being designated as Brazil nut or castanha concessions. Brazil nut trees are actually key when it comes to rainforest conservation. The nuts can only be harvested from trees that grow in the rainforest. The forest around the trees must be maintained. It must remain relatively healthy and intact. This means that it is a relatively sustainable activity. It is hunting associated with Brazil nut extraction, but it's believed to be minimally impactful due to the Brazil nut season being quite short. Only one species of animal can open a Brazil nut and therefore spread the seeds. And this animal is called an agouti. And I'll show you a camera trap later, a camera trap video of one later. Here are another couple of interesting species. The tree on the left is known as a cannonball tree. If you look closely, you'll see that the fruit is actually growing on the trunk of the tree. On the right is one of many species of palm. There are a couple of interesting things going on here. One is that the legs are covered in spikes, which protect it from animals. And secondly, there are a lot of legs. When I, was, when I first moved to Peru, I was told that these and several other species are collectively known as walking palms, and that gradually they move by growing a new leg, and then another leg, and then another, they can shift towards resources such as sunlight. I actually only learned this year that that isn't true. <laughs> and I've probably told hundreds of people that story over the years. I wish it was true. 
There are over 1,800 species of bird in Peru. I'd be here for hours, if not days, if I spoke about all of them. So I decided to focus on just one very cool bird, the Watson. You can often see Watson in big groups along the riverbanks on the vegetation that overhangs the water. You might ask why a large turkey sized bird can sit so exposed without being predated on or being hunted. Well, there are a couple of very unique things about this species. Firstly, young Watson have a claw at the end of their wing. So when a predator comes, they can dive into the water for safety before using the claw to climb back into the nests, like little dinosaurs. Watson are the only living bird species to have claws on their wings. They do lose them as they become older. Secondly, the reason that people don't generally eat Watson is in their nickname. They're called stink birds. They eat leaves which they ferment with the help of bacteria in a really large crop, kind of like a cow does. Um, and this also apparently gives the meat a really unpleasant taste and odour. Some of my favourite species in the Amazon rainforest are the reptiles, and here are some of the wide variety of species present. Two of my favourite species are here, the aquatic coral snake, which is on the top right, and then the rainbow boa, a little baby one, which is on the bottom. There are over 400 species of reptile known to exist in the Amazon, and probably a lot more that have yet to be described by science. There are also over a thousand species of amphibians across the Amazon. Just the small area where I work even has unbelievable biodiversity. This is only a sample of some of the photos that I have. I'm going to come back to frogs a little bit more later, like my title suggested. The Amazon is estimated to be home to as many as two and a half million species of insect, many of which are still undescribed by science. One acre alone is estimated to have over 70,000 species present and scientists once found over 700 species of beetle on just one tree. I don't want to focus too much on the negatives during this talk, but it is important to be aware that despite the vastness of the Amazon, it is a great risk and thereby so is the biodiversity within it. Most of my work has been along a river called the Las Piedras. In 2011, the Interoceanic Highway was completed. This road joins Peru with Brazil and it stretches for over two and a half thousand kilometers. The highway opened up the rainforest. Other roads, dirt roads like this one here, cut into the rainforest. For me to reach my field site, I first travel along the highway for about an hour before turning onto a 50 kilometer dirt road, which stretches from the highway to the banks of the Las Piedras. This road makes the area accessible to researchers and conservationists like myself, turning what used to be a two day journey into just a few hours on a dry day but it has also made the area accessible to loggers. There are some legal logging concessions much further upriver and some limited timber extraction is permitted in some Brazil nut concessions. But this area has been designated by the government predominantly for the harvesting of Brazil nuts. Much of the timber that leaves has been harvested illegally, sometimes without the permission of the landowner, who will spend most of the year away from the concession because Brazil nuts are seasonal. Every year that I return, we pass more and more trucks. Last year, 11 trucks full of ironwood passed us. It can be difficult to see this. That trip into the forest is always a mix of excitement and anticipation as we approach the river, but it's also sometimes tinged with sadness and fear. On a more positive note, this here is the beautiful Las Piedras River that I was talking about. The road, seeing the ancient trees leaving, is one of the two things that really inspired me to work to protect this area, and the other is the view in this photograph, the Mirador. It's a little cliff overlooking intact forest which stretches as far as the eye can see. Most of it is now protected as part of a conservation corridor initiative by several organisations. And if sometimes you're struggling in the forest, if it's a bit claustrophobic, if you're having a bad day, if you go up to the Mirador and you just you, you get your perspective back, you remember where you are and you remember why what you're doing is important. So now that I've covered a little bit of biodiversity in the Amazon, I want to talk now about my work. So I first started working in Peru in 2015 when I was 24 years old. I worked as the mammal team coordinator for an NGO called Fauna Forever. It was my first salaried position as a biologist and I was really lucky to end up there. I actually arrived at a really interesting time where the paperwork for a new reserve had just been finalised. I was one of the first people on the ground asked to cut trails and to carry out rapid assessment surveys and baseline data collection for medium and large bodied mammals. I was thrown in at the deep end. I'd spent six months before at a field station in Paraguay, 
but this in Peru was fieldwork at its most basic and I'll show you some photos in a minute. When I arrived, I waded through about 700 metres of swamp with my backpack and laptop to arrive to a little clearing with one small plastic tarp strung up between trees. No toilet, no clean drinking water. My tent flooded on the first night when we heard, as we heard a jaguar calling close by. But slowly, that muddy patch of forest became home. This is an early photograph of our campsite. You can see a couple of construction workers there um, and they were overseen by the man at the front who is a highly skilled construction worker called Andreas Vera who manages to use a lot of sort of natural resources in the rainforest to build these incredible structures. This is what we ended up with for our six months there. Um, there's a tent for the kitchen, you can just see the dining table at the far end, the red containers are the bins, there are other plastic boxes that contain food. The tent in the far background was where the bunk beds were. You'll notice that we're missing two components generally considered to be necessary for a house. Those are walls and a floor. In the first few months we lived in rubber boots and puddles, the bunk beds were sinking into the mud. So we made these little stepping stones from cut down trees, which are um, called, we call galletas, which means cookies. So as a result, the camp became known as galletas and to this day, that sort of patch of now abandoned rainforest is known as galletas. I made myself a little house. <laughs> I got a bit carried away. I made a little sign that says Holly's house. I have a little bridge there so that when it is really, really muddy, I didn't get uh, wet feet coming back from the shower. A bag to hang my, a stick to hang my bag on, a stick to hang my boots on upside down at night. There's a hammock just out of sight, but it, it became really, really homely. I absolutely loved camping there. The conditions were basic, but we did actually have a bathroom. Um, on the right, you can see our outdoor loo with a view and on the left is our shower. You probably can't quite see but there, it's essentially a plank of wood over a ditch and then above our heads was a pipe with water. Um, generally you'd be showering at night so you'd hang your headlight on the pipe above your head and have your shower there and try not to drop your soap in the ditch. The food is, is, is decent, there's a lot of, of rice. This is a classic pat lunch um, where you can use a leaf from a plant called a heliconia and the dish there is called chow fat. It's basically stir fried rice with whatever's lying around. Put in. I think there's some sausage in this one. Um, food can vary a lot depending where you're based. I've done a lot of work recently in ecotourism and the food is phenomenal, better than some restaurants that I've eaten in. People often ask me about my journey into the rainforest. It's a few hours, it's not too bad, providing that it doesn't rain, in which case the road might close or you'll get stuck for hours or even overnight. As you can see, we got a bit stuck here in the photo on the right. The sites I work on along the Las Piedras River are accessible only by boats, so everything must go by boat. That's mattresses, toilets, food, water, everything. If it rains or if it's the wet season, it can be a bit wet, as you can see on the right. So my daily work was line transect surveys um, for something called line transect distance sampling. So this involved getting up in the dark at around half past four or five in the morning, eating breakfast with my headlight before hiking through the forest to begin my first transect at dawn. I then walked very slowly along a straight trail at a pace of one to one and a half kilometres an hour. I recorded every mammal that I saw or heard. I also took measurements, so the distance from the observer, me, to the animal that I saw, and also the distance from the trail to the animal, which is known as the perpendicular animal distance. And this methodology allows for estimations of abundance of frequently encountered species. So species such as a lot of the primates like capuchins, uh, deer, peccary, which is sort of like a type of wild pig, um, squirrels and agouti. These hours and hours and kilometres and kilometres in the rainforest gave me an experience that I would never have had doing other types of field work, for example, hiking to set up camera traps. You become so in tune with your surroundings, your hearing, your sense of smell, everything becomes heightened. You can identify the crash of a capuchin leaping from one branch to another, the calls of the primate species. You can smell of peccary across the trail and whether they were white lip peccary or collared peccary. These skills have served me really well as a nature guide and also in being able to fully enjoy the forest, to immerse myself and appreciate the small signs of life all around. Animals are not going to jump out at you in the Amazon other than perhaps the primates. You're not going to come across a jaguar and a tapir in one day. You need to learn how to detect them and you need to learn to appreciate that Things are just out of sight. Another way to detect wildlife is by tracking. I was trained to do so by an indigenous man called Melo. 
Um, he's a little bit famous in the region, actually. He featured in a film several years ago called Cam Damo that I recommend looking up. Um, so I recorded tracks as part of my daily data collection. This is a really, really useful skill to have learned. Um, on the left here is a tapir track on a beach, and on the right are jaguar prints. These photos make it look really easy, <laughs> but it's rare to come across prints as clean as this. Most of the time, your you know, prints are obscured by leaves or other debris on the ground. Part of my job was to train interns and volunteers in monitoring methods. They'd accompany me on my line transects and help me with tasks such as cutting trails with a machete, which is what we were doing here, or exploring. We were also exploring here and we found an old little camp, a hunting camp um, quite far in the concession. In 2015, I had an incredibly lucky encounter with a jaguar. I'm going to briefly talk about it. I want to watch my time, but here my friend Harry is reenacting where the jaguar passed behind me. So part of my job, as I mentioned, was to cut a lot of line transects, um, a lot of trails for my transects, essentially, which is straight lines into the forest, hand cut with a machete. I cut 11 kilometres of trails and I ended up with a right tricep and my arm was much larger than my left arm. So I was about on this kilometre and a half ahead of my colleagues on this occasion and we, I was marking out a new trail. I wasn't actually cutting a trail, but I did with my machete and I spotted this this log across the trail in a patch of sunlight, which is actually quite rare when you live under the dense canopy. So I sat down, took off my shirt, thought, oh, this is nice, I'll just sit for a few minutes, catch some sun. And I stuck my machete in the ground beside me. Um, I'd been sitting for about two minutes and I glanced over my left shoulder, not the shoulder in this photo. And I don't know why, I don't know if I subconsciously sent something or what, but I looked over my shoulder and when I turned, I saw this moving wall of dull spots. I didn't, my eyes didn't even focus on the whole cat at first. The colour was a lot duller than I expected when you see, you know, bright spotted cats in books. Um, and my heart just stopped, everything just stopped and it froze, but then my eyes adjusted and it was a jaguar and it was very, very close. <laughs> it was crossing the trail behind me. So I have never felt so small, so weak, so slow, so vulnerable in my life. I was sitting on the ground with my back to the largest land predator in, uh, <laughs> in South America. Um, so I remember my boss's advice, make yourself big, make a noise. So grab a machete, close my eyes, which I kind of regret, <laughs> and stood up and hit my machete off the log and the jaguar exhaled and it turned and it vanished. And I then had a very stressful walk back to my colleagues where I was trying not to run and then I bumped into a group of trumpeters, which were birds, and they all flapped around and made a noise. And oh my goodness, it was quite, quite the experience and my whole body was trembling with adrenaline by the time I got back. Um, but it gave, it gave me a whole new respect for the rainforest and I've never I've never seen a jaguar since I might never see one again but I really was privileged to have had that encounter. Following on from the line transects they don't you can't record every animal in a line transect at least not regularly enough to make accurate assessments of abundance so nocturnal species elusive species wide-ranging species and species that avoid trails they can be added to a species diversity list faster with the help of camera traps. It's important to say here that this was not a camera trap grid for occupancy analysis. This was a few individual cameras used to supplement our species list when I was carrying out rapid assessment surveys and baseline data collection. Also, setting up cameras and learning the hard way when things went wrong was a great experience that has helped me and will continue to help me in the future. So I'm going to show you now quickly a couple of minutes of some videos from my time at Fauna Forever and I'll talk you through each species as it plays. So these are Tyra, they're a mustelid, rather like a large weasel. Generally they're solitary but sometimes you get a mother and young in a group which is probably what's going on here. This is a tapir which is the largest land mammal in South America. They have a prehensile nose, which you'll see closer in a video in a second. These two individuals um, are a mother and juvenile. You can see that the younger individual in the back has some stripes just faintly visible. When they're very young, they're like little striped humbugs. This is a, a shot, close up shot of the prehensile nose. It's like a short elephant trunk and the tapir uses it to grasp the leaves. This is an ocelot, one of the spotted cats that are present in the Amazon. This is a puma, the second largest cat after the jaguar. I think they're called mountain lions in the United States. This is a coati, 
um, they're, I think they're related to a raccoon. This is a male, um, the males are solitary, the females live in groups with the young, and it's quite funny if you do encounter a group of females with young, uh, they have this really strange tactic where instead of climbing further up trees, they actually all drop, <laughs> drop to the ground and, sc and scatter, which is quite fun. This is a jaguar walking through our old campsite. So in 2016, we moved campsite. You can see here the old gaietas that I talked about. And this is just a nice sign of the, the rainforest taking back a part of the part of the land that was disrupted, I suppose, by us in our campsite. This is a giant armadillo. He is at a leaf cutter ant nest. That's why that land's cleared. It's kept clear by the ants. And then he comes along at night and he digs around to eat some of the ants causing chaos as he does. You can see him digging up the dirt here. This is one of uh, the two deer species we have. We have grey brocket deer and red brocket deer. These are collared peccary, again one of two species that are also white lip peccary. Another red brocket deer, a young one this time. This is an ocelot having a look at my camera. Sometimes if you don't clean the camera properly, if you've had sweaty hands or if you were insect repellent, you can leave a smell that might attract wildlife, which generally is not ideal. <laughs> this is a puma again. And I think we just have a jaguar to go. Oh, this is a grison. This was an animal that's incredibly rare to capture in camera trap, actually. It's like a little honey badger. And here's a jaguar. So as well as documenting what species are present, camera traps can also record animal behaviour. And this led to me making an exciting scientific discovery. During a cold weather phenomenon known as a friahe, I found a dead armadillo. I set up a camera trap and after hundreds of videos of vultures, I captured a video of a short-eared dog scavenging. And this was the published into a short note, which was the first published record of short-eared dog scavenging on any carcass and, and also specifically on armadillo. So I'll just very quickly show you the video. That's the short-eared dog there. They're very elusive, they're quite rare to capture on camera um, and quite rare to see as well. They're one of two dog species that live in the Amazon. There's also a dog called the bush dog. And this is the short eared dog having a little nosy around the armadillo carcass. And there are a few videos and it has a little leap and then it leaves again. It comes back again a few days later. Monga Bay interviewed me actually and they wrote an excellent lengthy article about this, which amazingly was their one of the most popular, um, most read article in November with 105,000 people. Um, 105,000 reads and that ties in with my next section of my talk which touches briefly on science communication and environmental education. So this is where frogs come in. Aside from my speciality in large mammals I also have a natural love for frogs and a strange talent for finding them and in recent years I've been lucky to work with herpetologists who study caiman and snakes and frogs including anaconda. I've been able to embrace my love for frogs and spend time teaching others and this has all been thanks to my friends and now colleagues at Tamandua Expeditions where I work as an expedition guide. Having a broader understanding of the environment you work in can be beneficial as well. So although my expertise is in mammals, you could say that if I was in a US school, my major would be mammals and my minor would be frogs. <laughs> Guiding is really rewarding. Some of the trips are student groups, they come to the rainforest and carry out research projects and I learn as much from the students as they learn from me. There's always a focus on enjoying the rainforest, getting out there, getting dirty, swimming, climbing trees, experience nature at its best. Ecotourism also provides jobs for local people, alternative livelihoods for people. We have staff who are former miners, who are former loggers. They know the forest well, and so their skills are being put to any use, essentially. We don't all have to jump on a plane to the Amazon, but I think to experience nature is so important. No matter where you are, find your local patch, notice the little things and learn to enjoy it. And as David Attenborough said, no one will protect what they don't care about and no one will care about what they have never experienced. I'm going to finish with a couple of quotes from Jane Goodall who inspired me to embark upon this path as a conservation biologist. She says, what you have to do is get into the heart and how do you get into the heart? With stories. 
And that's why I think events like the Global Biodiversity Festival and organisations such as Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants are so important because it spreads the message and, you know, you, you're all here because you know exactly why. <laughs> um, I'm now based at an organisation called ACIR and I'm really excited to kind of see where my career in the Amazon, where, where ACIR helped me go in the next few years. And um, I've also been lucky enough to be based at the University of Oxford at Wild Crew for the past several years. So I feel now I'm armed with all these new skills to go back and design new research projects and analyse the data and hopefully have a good conservation impact in the area. So thank you very much for listening to my presentation. I think I'm just on time there. Wow, Holly, thank you very much. That was that was a very interesting presentation and I enjoyed the part about the frogs the most. <laughs> uh, do you, that, that was an awesome story of um, realizing you're sitting just a couple of meters uh, away from, from this amazing, big, kind of scary, but also beautiful cats. And you realize you're so small and tiny. And then your reaction was, uh, wow, that's quite an experience. Um, uh, how do you interact with frogs? Frogs? Um, so most of my frog work is done at night um, on night walks. So I use a headlight to find frogs. And if you walk around with a headlight really, really close to your eyes, then you can spot the frog eye shine. So usually I'm kind of looking off trail and see some eye shine and I'll kind of pop off trail and see what it is. And if it's a frog, then I'll, if I'm guiding, I'll call other people to come and see. Um, and people will take their photos of the frog. But it's, most of these are tree frogs sort of in the mid, mid level on the, sometimes there's some on the floor and um, sometimes there are some high up. So I, I love frogs. There's, there's so many species. I'm still learning. There's so many species still to learn. And there are some that you find, you might find like 20 of one species in one night and other times you, you, you never see them. There are some species I've still not seen. Yeah. yeah, so many species, and each one is very important to to biodiversity and, and to uh, everyone. We're all connected. Wow. Um, what is your um, what What are you dreaming? What are your key objectives for your further uh, projects in the region? I'm playing with a couple of ideas at the moment. Um, my goal is to, to undertake a PhD in the region. So um, just recently I started working for a SEER and they're very generously going to help me fund that position. Um, so I have a couple of ideas. One is looking at the impact of mammal, um, impact on mammal communities using camera traps by um, different human communities that are working and living in that area. And hopefully to try and promote maybe more sustainable use of the forest. I'm also still really, really interested in the short-eared dog, and I would absolutely love to carry out an ecological study. I think it's risky for a PhD. It would require GPS collaring, um, but it's something that I'm certainly going to try and do on the side if it's not my main project. Wow. Best of luck with everything. And speaking of the local communities, I'm always very curious to see how they react to all of these fantastic initiatives like yours. Uh, are they supportive? Are they observant? Uh, are they neutral, not really involving themselves? What's the dialogue like? It's definitely changed over the years. So when I was first out there, I'd say the community were maybe, they just thought we were tourists coming through who'd maybe buy some snacks in their shops. Um, over the years that has definitely evolved um, and a lot of people from the local community are employed in the ecotourism initiatives and the research initiatives that go on there. I think there's still a gap in terms of environmental education. I think there could be more done and that's something I want to do when I go back because I have friends there and I have some relations. Um, there's a few different projects I'm playing around with. Um, one would be stingless bee honey hives so that the women have a sustainable livelihood um, and also work with the children because I think the children are the most important. Um, yeah. <laughs> Agreed. Agreed. Wow. Holly, thank you very much. That was a very interesting talk. Thank you for being with us today. And uh, we all wish you best of luck uh, in so all your work. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.